It's a, that's right. Second Samuel chapter two. We're in Second Samuel chapter two. And Second Samuel two. Yeah, he pushed it already. Second Samuel two. This is. It's really an exciting time for Israel. We're gonna start reading about the coronation of God's choice for king. There's a few um, illuminating verses in Psalm 76 that I'm going to look at real quick that show kind of what's happening in 2 Samuel. I think what I'm going to do is like what Pete did. He he was a wonderful example last week. And um, I'm going to just read through the chapter as I go. Uh, I think that's a good way to do it. Instead of taking 10 minutes or whatever to, at the start here. So I, wanna, I want to kind of introduce everything with Psalm 78. It shows what's happening. Psalm 78 and verses 70 through 72 reveal the why David is chosen to lead Israel. And these verses serve as a nice introduction to 2 Samuel chapter 2. In uh, Psalm 78 verses 70 through 72, we read specifically that God, he chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the nursing ewes. He brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with skillful hands. So let's pray, shall we? And we'll begin. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for the example of David that we read about here. Now, Lord, we pray as we uh, open your word, we pray that you would help us, that you would speak to our hearts from your holy word. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, Lord, you, you do give us your word to teach us and instruct us in spiritual principles to live our life by. Pray that you would use this time to your glory now in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So, the Lord chose David because he was a servant shepherd in, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, a process begins to make David this, the, sh- the servant shepherd king of Israel. Chapters 2 through uh, 5 expound the seven and a half year process, process of how David becomes king over all Israel. Interestingly, that seven and a half year process is omitted in Chronicles chapter 11. It's not even mentioned. Uh, That passage just goes straight to David ruling all Israel. Abner Ishibosheth, that is a fun name to say. Say it six times really fast. Ishboseth, thank you. Ishboseth, there. Seth. Ah. Thank you, hon. Yes, he is. It's, It's very similar. Um, anyways, uh, Abner and Isiboseth aren't even mentioned in um, First Chronicles 11, and there's good reason that we're not going to go into here. However, our chapter today is the first step of a multi-step process, uh, and we become aware of three stages to get there. We see uh, in this chapter, we see the anointed king, we see an appointed king, And we see the battle for the hearts of Israel begins in this chapter. Our first step today, I'm going to uh, begin with this stage one, verses one through seven, which I called the anointed king of of Judah, excuse me, of Judah. Verses one through four reads, after this, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. David said, to which shall I go up? And he said, to Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahim Anoam of Jezreel, and uh, Abigail, the widow of Nabal of of Carmel. And uh, David brought up his men who were with him, everyone with his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Now, if you remember... Uh, way back in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, David, by the command of the Lord, is anointed king for a first time by Samuel. That Hebrew word for anointed 
is used also uh, here in this chapter, the same, the same exact word in verse four. It's mashach, and the scriptures tell us that David is actually anointed king twice, uh, first by Samuel, and secondly here by the men of Judah. Becoming king is the promise that God made to David, and in chapter two that we're in today, we're seeing the first step in fulfilling that promise. But why did it take so long? Why did, why did it take so long from the first anointing of a very, as, as David is a very young man, to the second anointing where he's 30 some years old, 30 years old? Uh, let me illustrate that this way, maybe. At a very young age, I wanted to drive a car. Uh, my mom and dad had a super cool convertible, a 65 Ford Galaxy. Um, it was really neat, it was baby blue. And they gave me the car before I could drive. Who can you imagine that, huh? There, there I am, the entitled brat. Okay, you, there you thinking it, right? There it is. So I, the problem that I had was I had to wait to drive to get that car. Now back, and it may be the still this way now. I'm not sure, but you get your driver's license as young as 16. Is that correct? Do you still get it at 16? Um, Somebody said, is that right? In California. In California. In California, you can get it at 16 years old. Well, I started, I went to school at uh, school driving lessons, because they had driving lessons back then. At school, 15 and a half, I took the driving lessons. And then on my birthday at 16 years old, I was on the road driving at night. Um, and just I started off right away with it. In retrospect, I think that maybe for me, 16 years old was a little bit young to start driving. My parents gave me specific driving rules. Um, and the very first night that I took the car out, I broke the rules and I lost the privilege of driving for two weeks um, and was on restriction for two weeks. Not a smart move, not a smart move. Uh, that was that was the first night. Within three months period of time, I was expelled for driving a semester from the parking lot of the, uh, the my high school that I was. They would not let me park in there because of my driving habits. Who knew they would be so serious about it, right? I'm not proud of it. I am not proud of it at all. Um, but you learn real quick that driving is not a right, it's a privilege, and it's a privilege that comes with responsibility. With great privilege comes great responsibility. That's Spider-Man 101. Um, how many times have you seen someone with an incredible gift but too immature for those responsibilities? That was me. Um, they're just not ready for the obligations. That's the case with David. Samuel, by specific direction of God, anoints David to be king many years earlier. But the scriptures tell us that he's still too young. He's, uh, he even looks young. They say that he's ruddy in appearance, so he had kind of a baby face is what, they're, what that means. Um, life's experiences needed to de deepen David's uh, life. It needed to uh, deepen, and, and to get there, David had to go through some things. Look. A few chapters ago, if you remember, David is willing to side with Achish in a possible battle against Israel. Now, that's not the responsible behavior of an Israeli Messiah-like king. David needed time to learn, and at 30 years old, um, he was anointed king again because he, would fi he had finally learned what it takes uh, and, and uh, what, it, what the meaning of things were. There are two characteristics that David learned from when he was anointed the first time to the second time. Uh, there, those two characteristics that he exhibited when he was grown up enough to be anointed. I want to suggest that we see David anointed king because he had learned both to be a servant king and to be a shepherd king. Characteristics that we see and read in Psalm 78. And that, and that only years of wandering the wilderness in the backside of the desert could really David learn that. And that's what, that's what happened. And so first thing I want to look at is David as the servant king. Verse 1 is what 
separates David really from other kings, how David becomes the, the main example of, <coughs> of how other kings throughout the scriptures are compared. And it says there, he's God's servant. Verse one, we see him as God's servant. After this, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. And David said, to which shall I go up? And he said to Hebron. We just, we learned just a second ago or mentioned just a second ago. Actually, um, what's fascinating to me is we learn the opposite about Saul. In, in fact, in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 14, we read of Saul. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Now that's pretty straightforward. What makes David, first of all, this, this servant that God is looking for and want to work with is that he inquires of the Lord. The verse is pretty clear. On the other hand, God, seeking God is one of the primary lessons that David learns as a fugitive in the wilderness. David had to be brought very low, losing everything, to discover once again how much he needed God. In Samuel chapter 29, 1 Samuel chapter 29, David reaches an incredible low point in his life upon his return to Ziklag. Remember that, verse 3? And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and daughters taken captive. Everything that David had and his things that everything that his men had was gone. Verse 6 tells us, and it reads, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his own sons and daughters. He was low. He was a very low point in his life there. It's what we do at that low point that counts. Verse 6 says, says this again. I'll say it. And David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. How did David recover? How did David do that? How was David able to strengthen himself? Verse 7 says, David said to, to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So uh, Abathar brought the ephod to David. David, God's servant, asks for specific direction by the use of the ephod. What David gets uh, bas basically, David learns in the backside, on the backside of the desert, David learns to ask God for his sovereign direction in all things. He's not winging it any longer. So as God's servant, he's anointed king in this chapter because we see that there's this dual aspect that's working in David's life. There's, there's David learns to inquire, and then we're going to see that David is anointed king because Judah inquires back at him. First, David inquires. An inquiry is a formal uh, investigation into a matter. The thought and implication here in um, this section is that God's servant learned to inquire about things by himself for God. Something Saul, we just read, never did. Again, it reads in verse 1 of our chapter, David, after this, David inquired of the Lord. We read of no priests involved in this, in David's inquiry. The Hebrew word that's translated as inquired here is more than just to ask a question. That word inquired in the Hebrew, it means to consult with a deity or an oracle. In other words, the Hebrew is implying that David used the physical ephod by himself. And, it, and, uh, and he did the same thing in 1 Samuel chapter 29, verse 7. Now, in the past, uh, using the ephod was only a priest thing to be done by the officiating priest. Yet, for some reason here, we see David receive the special waiver of use, if I can put it that way. You know, um, maybe three weeks ago or so, Skip and I were, uh, we were at... Home group, home group, that's where we, we were talking about um, recording music. I don't know if you were there or not to hear that conversation, Norm. Um, it was very interesting. He's recording music and different things, and he's got, a, he's got a certain program that Skip is telling me about that he uses to record music, uh, voice tracks, using his computer and stuff. There's a, 
there's a recording program that he's using, and really, it's pretty basic. Um, when he mentioned it, I, I'd heard about it. I use, I've used another one in the past. I was telling Skip uh, while we were talking about this, uh, of this professional audio program that my son uses that's called ProLogic. My son does it professionally. Um, and I have it, it's incredibly complex to use. Basically, this, this uh, program is out of my league. It's over my head. But what you can do with this program is you can create full band sounds right there on your Mac. Uh, there, it's, it's very, very, very powerful. You can auto-tune vo voices. So if someone sings out of tune, you can bring them back into tune. You can, um, if somebody doesn't have any vibrato in their voice, you can add vibrato. If their voice is, has too much vibrato, you can take the vibrato out of their voice. It slices, it dices. It's the modern man's vegematic for music. It's just a great, great program. Um, and I did some recording with my son uh, on it. And after watching him use this program, it was, it was just fascinating. And it's really a program that only professionals can use. David using the ephod is like Skip or myself using Logic Pro. It's to its full capacity. But here in some way, for some reason, God allows David to break the mold and ignore the warning label of for officiating priests only and he's able to use it. He's using the ephod inquiring of God on a priestly level. Because David is God's servant, that's why. And uh, David has a divine waiver of use. Not, not, uh, now, with that in your mind, think of this. Hebrews 10, verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart and full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast the confession of hope without wavering. He is faithful. He is, who has promised is faithful. If you know the power of the blood, if you have experienced the precious blood of Jesus, you're invited to approach by a new and living way, the throne of grace, anytime anywhere for any occasion on a professional level if I can put it that way like David did receiving all oh, you, you receive your backside of desert degree and you're ready to go that's the idea here that's what this is teaching us and David acted upon what he had received he asked he asked God what should I do and it tells us that David acted verse 2 so David went up there and his two wives also, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, of the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David brought up his men who were with him, everyone with his household, and they lived in the towns of Hebron. David inquires, and David is directed to go up to Hebron, the great city of refuge. And now we learn that once David is there, we see that, the, that Judah, the tribe of Judah, inquires inquires of David. David is not pushing himself forward in any way. Though he's aware that God's anointed him in his life, remember? Samuel anointed him, so he knows something unusual there. Uh, but David has not in any way pushed himself to the forefront. It's like the tribe of Judah that came to David at Hebron and inquired of him to be king. They want him to be king is the idea. And he is anointed king, and at that moment, Hebron goes from a, not just a city of refuge, but it becomes a royal city for the kingdom. David is not demanding to be king, but David, David has fought for no position. Uh, it was Judah that inquired of David after David inquires of God, and God gives him direction. They ask David, would you be king over us? And joyfully, they submit themselves to him. Verse 4, it reads like this. And the men of Judah came, and there they, men, they anointed David king over the house of Judah. People see David's gift and acknowledge the work that God has done in his life. What moves the narrative forward? David is God's servant. That's the difference. 
Um, and this leads to the second aspect of David being anointed as king that I want to suggest is not only is David the servant king, but David also has the attitude of a shepherd king. Right away, chapter Second uh, uh, Samuel two, uh, chapter two reveals the heart of David as a shepherd over all Israel. David knows Saul has died, but he doesn't know the details. Now he finds out in verse four. We learn that he learns the details. It says, when they told uh, when they told David it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul. David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, May you be blessed by the Lord because you showed his loyal, this loyalty to Saul, your Lord, and buried him. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you, and I will do good to you because you have done this thing. Now therefore let your hands be strong and be valiant, for Saul, your Lord, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Who is Jabesh Gilead and why are they significantly attached to Saul? So significantly attached. Well, according to Edersheim, Jabesh Gilead was the capital city of the whole district of Gilead on the west side of the Jordan within the inheritance of Gad. First, it's recorded in Judges that there was an intense battle between the Benjamites and the rest of Israel for a very vile act that took place in their territory. You can read about it in Judges 20, 21. Uh, Israel nearly wipes out the whole tribe of Benjamin. And during that war, there's such animosity between Israel and the tribe of Gen Je uh, Benjamin that Israel vowed to never let a daughter marry a Benjamite. Afterwards, the Israelites re uh, regretted that Vow. So what they did is they took 400 virgins of, of Jabesh Gilead and gave them to the Benjamites to preserve the heritage. So you see that this is how the Benjamites and Jabesh Gilead are connected. Second, in Saul's day, when Saul was king, uh, the a Ammonites came and they besieged Jabesh Gilead. And it's implied that since they're connected by marriage, the elders of Jabesh sent word for help to the territory of the Benjamites. And Saul, if you remember reading it, Saul hears the news, pulls together an army, if you remember, and saves Jabesh Gilead from the Ammonites. This being possibly, uh, arguably, uh, being Saul's bravest and greatest victory. If anyone cared for Saul, it was the men of Jabesh Gilead. And David, what David does is David acknowledged, David blessed, and David thanked them for their courage and loyalty to save the honor of the Lord's anointed, Saul, in death. Now, this is the heart of a shepherd. <clears throat> Though Jabesh Gilead would naturally be more aligned with the Benjamites and the house of Saul and whoever Saul's heir was, it didn't stop David from gracious words and thankfulness and courteous for the courage of the men of Jabesh Gilead. This is why David was anointed king, because David was a servant and David was a shepherd king to all of Israel. But it would still take the seven and a half years and multi-step process to play out as much as David was anointed king. In the opposite direction, we witness in this chapter how Ishbosheth. <laughs> Ishbosheth comes to the throne over all of Israel. One man, albeit a great man, misguidedly appoints Ishbosheth as king, stage two, verses eight through 11, the appointed king of Israel. So David's the anointed king of Judah. But in this chapter, we see the appointed king of Israel. Beginning with verse eight, we read, but Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim and made him king over Gilead. And the Asherites and Jezreel, and by the way, if you notice Jezreel, that is where one of David's wives was uh, from, and Ephraim and Benjamin and all Israel. And Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David, and the time... Uh, that David was king in, in Hebron 
over the house of Judah was seven and a half, seven, seven years, six months. Now, many commentators note the math issues that are going on here. David reigned in Hebron seven and a half years. Ishbosheth reigned over Israel two years. There are f there's a five and a half year period where no one seems to be reigning over Israel. We all note that from First Chronicles, um, in the in the um, the opposite story or the the parallel story in First Chronicles, there's nothing mentioned at all about that seven and a half year discrepancy. So we really don't have, or the five and a half years discrepancy, we have no insights from First Chronicle. What we do know is that Abner was the power base behind Ishbosheth's reign. Verses 8 and 9, Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, or Mahanaim and, made him, uh, and made him king. I mentioned back in 1 Samuel 26 that Abner was a true loyalist. If you, I just happened to be doing that chapter a few weeks ago. He was a true loyalist, a national hero, a patriot, but marching on the wrong side of God's plan. You follow Abner's life and you see he does many things for God's people. And full disclosure here, uh, Abner was Saul's first cousin. So David personally knew Abner. Uh, and it was Abner that pointed out, in fact, that David uh, pointed out David to Saul way back when, when David was a young man and went out to fight Goliath. Some commentators assume that the difference in the time here is because it took Abner five years to convince Israel that Ishibosheth was the right man for the job. In fact, it suggested uh, it was Abner that changed Ishibosheth's name from Escabel, to, which by the way, Escabel means, and you see that name in, in First Chronicles being used instead of Ishibosheth. Uh, Escabel means fire of Baal. Uh, Ishbosheth means man of shame. Now, I work in advertising and marketing. That's what I do for a living. And if you're appointing a new king, especially to Hebrews, uh, man of shame is a lot more woke than um, a man by the name of Fire of Baal. To, if, you're, if you're in Israel, you really want man, the guy named Man of Shame rather than Fire of Baal. Because Baal was a, a Canaanite Phoenician god. Eshbel is a marketing nightmare. Um, it's it's really it's not good product branding. So you see what you see the they're assuming that that's why the name was changed here. Um, many commentators, uh, you can't win support in Israel if your name means fire of Baal. But I digress here. I believe the point in this passage is to show that Ishibosheth was appointed, not anointed. Um, and, and, he's a, and he's appointed by a very powerful, albeit misguided man, Abner, a man who was a national hero and a respected w uh, warrior. Practically speaking, apart from Abner's own design, I think what we see here is God is sovereignly using Abner apart from himself. In truth, Abner may, we, we're going to see in a few chapters that Abner just may be the main key to David winning the hearts of Israel. It's intriguing to watch how events just play out over the next, the next few chapters. Uh, and we're going to see that no matter who's in power, no matter the, what the intentions of the latest strong man backing this puppet government may be, God is always in control with his sovereign plan and his sovereign purposes. You know, we have big names, Soros, you know, we hear of these big names that are throwing lots of money. And you know what? God is still in control. You, 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 we don't have to worry, we don't have to fret is the idea. Slowly, we're going to see that what happens is the nation, uh, the, the, uh, the hearts of the nation are won over to David, God's servant, God's shepherd king. And Abner is but a tool and uh, is going to be played uh, in this scenario, uh, uh, he has an unwitting part in this plan. In fact, it all brings, uh, begins with 
what uh, begins with the small and with this last stage, which I'm going to the last section now, 12 through 32, is what I call the battle for the hearts of Israel begins. Who's ever heard of the, uh, the linchpin theory? Ah, no, my wife raises her hand, of course you have. <laughs> the linchpin theory says that when a small single event a linchpin gets pulled, it triggers a series of unpredictable and non-repeating incidents. A linchpin cascades multitude of lesser events and it ends up in a single life-altering large event. My suggestion is, is that's what's going on here in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and ending in chapter 5. This seven and a half year period, seven and a half years later, Abner, I'm suggesting, is the linchpin that God sovereignly uses to bring David to the throne and win the hearts of all Israel. Chapter 2 has four events, has four events in this section. The first event in verses 12 through 17 is what I call the small single event. This triggers, this, this event triggers other events to cascade to David's coronation. I'm suggesting that. Verse 12, it reads like this. Abner, the son of Ner, the servant of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruah, Zeruah, and the servants of David went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool, and the other on the other side of the pool, and Abner said to Joab, let the young men arise and begin to compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. We're going to zoom in here real quick on that verse 14. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men arise and compete before us. In the Hebrew language, Abner is not making a suggestion. It's really interesting because that's how you want to read this. But he's not making a suggestion or he's not making a request from Joab. Really, the strength of this phrase in the Hebrew is uh, when you read Abner said to Joab, in the Hebrew language, it's a command and a dictate. Um, from Abner's stature as a national hero, national hero, warrior, soldier, he's telling Joab, who is younger, what to do. Let the young men arise and compete before us. It's, he's, we're going to do this is what he's basically saying. And Joab complies with Abner's command saying, let them arise, and why not? Team Abner has just marched. We, he, he's marched from the other side of the Jordan. 24 hours, they figure, about. He's, he's marched his men from Mehanaam to arrive at Gibeon. On the other hand, Team Joab here in this section has only traveled seven hours from Hebron. Do the math. Who do you think is going to be freshest in that scenario? That word compete in the, in the English Standard Version is translated in the uh, King James Version as let the young men now arise, uh, let the young men now arise and play before us, which I thought was kind of an interesting uh, way to the word to use. The Hebrew word there for play is shaka, which means to, uh, means to laugh in pleasure and to play and to be in sport. Abner's directive that he's saying is something like this. To, he's saying, let, there, let these 12 men, let 12 young men come out representing both sides, grab their swords, head out into an open field and compete as if this was some sort of video game or something. It's, it's really rather interesting. Winner takes all, the victory walks away. The victor walks away, you know, in the, from the battle. Some commentators say that this is sort of a cultural representative warfare thing. And what they like to do is they like to ex bring up the example of how David fought Goliath. Uh, it, they use that as an example as a winner-take-all kind of deal. But really, when you think about it, that's not really what happened with David and Goliath. Um, Goliath taunted and defied Israel. David killed Goliath. And once David won, the Israelites didn't jump up and say, okay, game over, we won. You leave our towns and we go home. 
No, what happened is we, when we go back to the passage, we know that the men of Israel, once David had, had killed Goliath, the men of Israel leaped out of the trenches with a shout and chased down the Philistines to their death. Now, I've not read Art of War, but something tells me that Abner's strategy here is not the strategy that Sun Tzu would have connected with or suggested. Um, in fact, I think Joab is a little taken back when you read this. His reply in verse 4 uh, is like a, a reply that you would say for, to re because you respect someone's uh, stature more than condoning their war strategy here. He simply replies, Joab replies, let them arise, let them rise, excuse me. In the Hebrew, those three words, let them rise, is kum. It's one word. And the thought of that one word is, um, is the idea of after resting, let's go kind of deal. Stand up, let's go. That's what that one word means. Basically, Joab is giving a very short, quick, snappy retort to uh, Abner here when you, in, in the Hebrew, from the Hebrew when you look at it. In context, in our, it's, the, it's like we would say in our modern day vernacular, we would say, whatever. That's, that's, that's what, uh, that's Joab's response. To, let's go out, let's have 12 men from both sides and they'll have the contest and the winner will take all and Joab saying, whatever. That's the kind of idea, just, just didn't laugh at him, just was all right, and out of respect for him. Why does Abner use this combat war strategy? The only thing that I can think of and come up with, and this is probably where Pete would ask you, what do you think? But I'm not that kind of guy because I just don't do that. And I, someday maybe I'll learn to be like Pete um, in these things. But needless to say, uh, I think what, what the thing that I come up with is that Abner was attempting to avert some bloody civil war between uh, Israel and Judah. This idea of a representative war where a few victors determine the outcome of a major conflict. Personally, I think he's trying to avoid a highly destructive war. It would be like Robert E. Lee walking out to meet General Meade at the fields in, in Gettysburg. I've been to Gettysburg and uh, in, in, in seen the fields where those men fought one another. It would be like Robert E. Lee coming out beforehand and saying, hey, Let's get 12 guys from each side, if that's okay with you, and, 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 uh, and let's have them battle it out for us, and, and then the result of that will all just go home. And what do you think, if Robert E. Lee came out to say that, what do you think Meade would say? Not a chance. That's not what happened at Gettysburg. Uh, here, here's what happened, verse 15 through 16. Then they arose and passed over by number 12 for Benjamin and Ishibosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 of the servants of David. And each caught his opponent by the head and thrust his sword into his opponent's side. So they fell together. They all basically killed each other, is what happened. And therefore they call that place Hekabs has Urim which is at Gibeon. And it's the, the, the idea is, is that they named it a special name and a monument name, kind of what you would have at Gettysburg. Such a seemingly small, single event. What could go wrong here, right? Well, Abner's idea is, I'm gonna suggest it, is that linchpin that leads to a series of bigger, more destructive events down the road. All 24 men end up dying. There's no clear winner. And immediately what that does is it triggers both sides to get out of their positions where they are in a highly aggressive all-out civil war. Israel battling their brothers, the tribe of Judah. Uh, we know this because it says there in verse 17, it con verse 17 concludes, and the battle was very fierce that day and Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. If the 12 on 12 battle had finished as Ab Abner had uh, suggested, everybody would be home now living happily forever after, right? And you would have a sense of finality, but man possesses or proposes 
Man proposes is how it goes, right? Man proposes and God disposes. This is not what God's sovereign plan was. The next event is huge involving the linchpin, Abner. And this is why the, event, the events, I believe, are listed in chapter 2 here, this, this way of warfare. And I called it the unpredictable event. Here's the real unseen sovereign plan of God behind this terrible civil war. There's an un, they're all out battling one another. And there's an unpredictable smaller event within the bigger event that's taking place. And this is the sub-event within the major event that actually holds more ramification than the larger battle around them that is taking place. Verse 18. And the three sons of Zuru, who were Joab, Abishiah, and Azahel, there we'll get it, now Azael was as swift a foot as a wild gazelle, and Azael pursued Abner, and he and as he went, he turned neither to the right hand or to the left hand, following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, "Is that you, Azael?" And he answered, "It is I." Abner said to him, "Turn aside to your right hand or your left, and seize one of the young men, and take." his spoil, but Azael would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Azael, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift up my face before your brother Joab? But he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear so that the spear came out the back and he fell there and died where he was and all who came to that place were where Azael had fallen and died stood still that single blow to the abdomen killing Azael triggers huge repercussions uh, eventually this this um, Abner's the linchpin action that he took to end uh, to end the life of Azael um, Ad, Ad, Hazael is looking for his big moment in the sun. He arrogantly pursued one of the greatest warriors ever in Israel. When, when warned that his life was at stake, he refused to change direction. And for the safety of his own life, Abner struck him down in self-defense, an action totally justifiable and within scriptural rights. This becomes the leech, linchpin tragedy that leads to the throne of David. I'm suggesting that. Joab and Abijah, never, uh, Abishiah, never forgive Abner for killing their younger brother. And by chapter 5, this event leads to Joab avenging the death of his younger brother by killing Abner in cold blood. How deep was the anger of Joab and Abishiah? This unpredictable smaller linchpin within the bigger story it becomes a non-repeating event, the third thing. And I'd like to notice that the focus of the brothers is Abner, not the war that's going on around them, but the victory, you know, with the, the victory of the Benjamites or the tribe of Judah or Israel in the tribe of Judah becomes subordinate to what their real pursuit is this is their one time to get Abner, and they are not going to let it go, and they run after him, and they're not going to let it get away. They are out for blood and angry and feel justified in killing Abner, verse 24. But Joab and Abishiah pursued Abner, and as the sun was going down, they came to a hill, Amma, which lies before Jaira uh, on the on the way of the wilderness to Gibeon. And the people of Benjamin gathered themselves together behind Abner and became one group and took their stand on the top of that hill. Abner and Abishai were blinded by hate. All Benjamin, uh, all Benjamin, all Benjaminites, if I could put it that way, rally behind Abner to save him, to save Abner, to make that stand. And they were all ready to, die, all of them are ready to die on this hill for a great man and for a good cause as far as they're concerned. This was going to be a bloodbath is what this is going to be. The only thing that, that uh, 
walks Jacob, uh, Joab back from the pre precipice is the truth of what Abner says, verse 26. Then Abner called to Joab, shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that the end will be bitter? How long will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit of their brothers? But Joab didn't really care. But Abner, Abner, Abner's voice is a voice of reason here. Abner still uh, stills this awful destruction that's about to befall them, but he doesn't surrender. It's interesting, uh, calling, calling it uh, by calling it. He, what Abner has here is the sensible behavior, and this kind of wakes Joab up. Verse twenty-seven, and Joab said, "As God lives, if you had not spoken." Surely the men would have not given up the pursuit of their brothers until morning. In other words, basically what you just said just stops everything, is what he's saying. He's basically saying, had you not said something, we would have been, uh, pursued you to the end. Finally awakened from the single-minded pursuit of vengeance for the sake of many lives, uh, Joab backs down, verse 28. And so Joab blew the trumpet and all the men stopped and, per, and pursued Israel no more, nor did they fight anymore. And this brings us to the conclusion of step one of this last, of the, and that's the last linchpin event that I'm suggesting in this, is the conclusion of a small single event. The armies return to their corners. Um, some wounds are deeper than others. Verses 19 through 32 read, and Abner and his men went all night, all, all that night through um, Arabah, they crossed the Jordan, marching the whole morning. To, uh, they came to Mahanaim. Joab returned from the pursuit of Abner. And when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing from David's servants 19 men besides uh, Ahisha, uh, Azahel, Azahel. But the servants of David had struck down Benjamin of Benjamin, 360 of Abner's men. And they took up Ahazael and buried him in the tombs of his father, which were at Bethlehem. And Joab and his men marched all night, and they broke, and the day broke upon them at Hebron. Obviously, David's army took on less casualties than Ahab's. I suppose that they would call this a victory, huh? That's probably why the numbers are mentioned specifically in this chapter. But... Of all the losses that I find most interesting is the mention of the loss of Azahel. Azahel, it's very detailed. Um, they brought his body back. They buried him in the tomb of his father at Bethlehem. After all, Azahel, Azahel is considered one of David's mighty men. Abner killed Azahel in self-defense. But this one small single event by Abner triggers Joab's lust for, for revenge. And it will also cause David to mourn on behalf of a great warrior. Hey, listen to this. Second Samuel chapter three, verse 32, after, after Abner has died, after Joab, Joab has killed Abner, it reads like this. They buried Abner at Hebron and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept, and the king lamented for Abner. Should Abner die as a fool dies? That act of mourning reveals to all the nation which is watching David's care for that nation. Chap uh, verse 36 of chapter 3. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as everything that the king did pleased them. Second Samuel 2 is the first linchpin that ultimately enables David to win the hearts of all Israel. All the people, it says. And we see how, how David is God's shepherd servant king throughout this section. Let me conclude this way. <coughs> In reading 2 Samuel 2, culturally, um, we see events and, occur and occurrences very different from our modern Western culture, don't we? I mean, there's, there's this 24 representative warriors thing going on. There's David with the ephod to inquire before God. Um, a single man powerful enough to influence a nation. That's Abner uh, to, to, be, to, uh, to set up a king. 
But what, is, but what is the same in this chapter with our culture today? And this is kind of what I want to grasp is this. And I want to note is that we may see um, a bunch of seemingly unrelated circumstances in our lives that is very difficult to grasp. You ever had that? Why did this have to happen? Why does this have to happen in our lives? And these kind of things, what they do is they cause extreme anxiety and worry for people. Uh, you know, just like it did at that time, it does for us today. And what I want to understand from 2 Samuel 2 is that God is in control and not let that go. He is sovereign and always sees the big picture. We may only see a small linchpin. We may have that just that one little linchpin event that we're going, why, Lord? And the Lord is saying, I'm using it for good. Romans 8, 28, let me close with this. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. A verse that's very misunderstood that the world uses incorrectly. But, but to those who are called, we understand it powerfully. We don't see the big picture as, as God does, do we? But we can trust that he's making things, all things, work together for good to those that are called according to his purpose. So I'm hoping that maybe today if you've got stuff that you're going through and it's tough and you've got that linchpin and you just don't understand it, we can be, have confidence that God has the big picture and put our hope and our trust in him. What do you say? George, will you close in prayer? <clears throat>